Good morning, and thank you for joining us today for our Farm Foundation Forum, Biologicals in Agriculture, Innovation, Science, and Promise. We're glad to have the opportunity to engage with you today. My name is Sherry Rogie Fiddler, and I'm the President and CEO of Farm Foundation, located just outside of Chicago, Illinois. I'm also a fifth generation farm owner operator from Nebraska. And as a farmer, I'm always interested to learn more about new products, methods, or technologies that may be important for my family to consider for our operation. So I'm really looking forward to learning from our speakers this morning. Before we get into today's program, I'd like to take just a couple of minutes to share a bit more about Farm Foundation. We are a 501c3 nonprofit working at the intersection of agriculture and society to address challenges that affect the entire food and ag value chain. Specifically, we are an accelerator of practical solutions for agriculture, accelerating people and ideas into action. The three levers we use to accomplish this are policy, innovation, and education. Forums such as today's are just one part of our extensive program of work, which is guided by our mission to build trust and understanding at the intersection of agriculture and society, and our vision to build a future for farmers, our communities, and our world. We rely on partnerships to fund our work and increase our impact. So if you're interested in learning more about funding or partnering with us, I invite you to reach out and explore collaboration. One easy way to support our mission is to text the word FIELD to the number 44321. You'll then receive additional instructions on how to donate to Farm Foundation right from your phone. I also encourage you to learn more about Farm Foundation and our work by visiting our website at farmfoundation.org or connecting with us on our social media platforms. If you're posting on social media about this morning's session, we ask that you please use hashtag Farm Foundation Forum. As we get underway with today's forum, I would like to just quickly go over a few housekeeping notes. We invite you to submit questions by clicking on the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. When submitting questions, please include your name and organization. And due to time limits, we may not be able to ask all questions submitted, but we'll certainly do our best. This form is being recorded and will be posted on our website at farmfoundation.org, and we'll send out that link following today's program. If there are any connectivity issues during the forum, we ask that you just stay on the forum as those generally rectify themselves after just a few moments. And finally, when the forum concludes, you'll receive a link to a short survey. Farm Foundation appreciates your feedback and your time in completing that survey. The conversation around biologicals for agriculture has been gaining momentum and farmers understandably have many questions about how to determine if they should incorporate these new products into their practices. We're glad to provide this opportunity today for farmers and other stakeholders to advance their understanding of this topic so that they have the information they need to decide what's best for their own operations. So let's get started. We're pleased to have Keith Jones with us as our moderator today. Keith is Executive Director of the Biological Products Industry Alliance, or BPIA, which he'll tell you more about in just a moment. Previously, Keith was Executive Director of a land trust focused on watershed protection and environmental education. He has also served as General Counsel to several organizations, including a National Environmental Trade Association and one of the largest water utility companies in the United States. So Keith, thank you for joining us to provide additional context for today's session and for guiding our panelists through this important discussion. So Keith, I'll let you take it from here. Well, thank you, Sherry. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here today. Thanks for this opportunity to share about biological products. I'm actually gonna start with just a couple of slides to hopefully set the stage for today's discussion. And then each of the panelists will offer some opening remarks and then we'll uh, jump into hopefully a lively discussion of q and A. I I would encourage everyone who's uh, participating today, go ahead and start putting your questions right into the Q&A now. You don't have to wait. And then we'll try to address you know, as many as we can, uh, as many questions as we can get to today. But first, I actually want to start with a, just a little bit about BPIA, and then I'll talk about some of our key concepts. OK, so you can go ahead to the next slide. OK, so let's start with who is BPIA, the Biological Products Industry Alliance. So we're a trade association based here in Washington, DC, where I am. We started back in 2003, and at that time, we started with just five member companies, five biopesticide companies at the time, 
and we've grown over the years uh, as the industry has grown. And we ended last year, 2020, with a record high of 137 member companies, and we continue to grow. We expect to exceed that number uh, this year. Our members include companies that are manufacturers, marketers, distributors, and even service providers related to these kinds of products. And our membership ranges from, we have some very small members, sole proprietors, up to some of the largest agrochemical chemical companies in the world. So it really is a, a, a range. Uh, what they all have in common is that they all deal with biological products as we're defining it. So things like biopesticides, biostimulants, even biofertilizers, and, and we'll get more into that. But probably one of the most exciting things for you all is we're expanding our membership. Uh, we've now opened it up to food companies and even growers. And the reason we did that is because we want to really be able to speak for the entire uh, biological industries. So not just the manufacturers, the marketers, but also the folks who use these products. So we, we can go ahead. Okay, great. So I just want to establish a couple of terms and then our speakers you know, will certainly add to this. What are biopesticides? So when we talk about biopesticides, we're talking about reduced risk pesticides. They are pesticides, but they tend to be naturally derived or synthetic equivalents. They can come uh, you know, from animals, plants, bacteria, fungi, uh, minerals. But the, the common factor is that they have little to no human health risk or environmental risk. So why would you want to use these products? Well, for a conventional grower, you can integrate them and, and reduce the, the pesticide risk. It helps with your, uh, your integrated pest management. For organic growers, you can control pests, but you can maintain your certified organic status. Uh, they can play an important role in, in public health. As I said, in integrated pest management programs, they, they're a part of that. They allow greater flexibility at harvest, at harvest time due to minimal re-entry and pre-harvest intervals, unlike a lot of traditional products. They generally require minimal or no personal protective equipment. They are very effective with resistance management, unlike products that maybe have just one mode of action and the pest can very quickly develop resistance to. Most biologicals have multiple modes of action and it's very challenging for a pest to become resistant. And finally, they can be uh, helpful with uh, residue management, uh, which is you know, always a, a big issue for growers. So that's biopesticides. The other term I wanna just talk a little bit about is biostimulants. So biostimulants, new product category. They are not pesticides. They're not fertilizers. There's a, a working definition you see here on the screen, plant biostimulants, a substance, microorganism, or mixture of thereof that can be applied to seeds, plants, the rhizosphere, the soil, or other growth media. They act to support a plant's natural nutrition process, independent of the biostimulant nutrient content. The plant biostimulant thereby improves nutrient availability, uptake, use, efficiency, tolerance to abiotic stress. So this definition comes from uh, USDA, actually, uh, back in 2018, the 20 farm, 2018 Farm Bill, USDA was directed to do a study on biostimulants and do a report to Congress and the president. And that's where this working definition comes from. It's, you won't find this, this definition in any federal or uh, even state law or regulation, but this is uh, the definition that USDA put out in its report. And it's a definition that the biostimulant agrees with and we're supportive of, and we're actually working hard to eventually have this put into law or, or regulation. So why would you want to use bio, uh, biostimulants? Well, again, similar to biopesticides, they're, they're natural or, or, or come from biological sources, but biostimulants, they enhance plant growth and development, but they improve the efficiency of plant nutrients. They are not nutrients in cells, but they can uh, improve nutrient uptake or reduce nutrient losses to the environment. They can act as soil amendments. Uh, they have a demonstrated ability to improve uh, the soil structure. And they can be useful tools for enhancing carbon sequestration, conserving, replenishing soil health and reducing carbon emissions and improving water quality. So that gives you a sense of uh, the types of products that we're gonna be talking about, biopesticides and biostimulants uh, that you can move on from that. So I'd actually like to introduce our first uh, substantive speaker, Mark Trimmer. Mark is the managing partner of Dunham Trimmer, and he's also a board member of BPIA. Mark has worked in biological products since 2003 when he joined Nutra Park as a vice president of research and development. And then to, in 2011, 
Mark co-founded Dunham Trimmer with William uh, Dunham. Today, Dunham Trimmer is the premier market research uh, firm that does uh, market research, market data, and strategic consulting. Uh, they're focused exclusively on biocontrol, biostimulants, and biofertilizer markets. And I can honestly say that this, I, I don't think uh, that I'm aware of anyone in the world who knows more about these markets, uh, both the current status of the, these markets and the growth potential for, for these markets uh, than, than Mark. So with that, I'll hand it over to Mark. Thanks a lot, Keith. You really uh, sort of set me up there as a, I have a high bar to live up to, so I'll try to do that. I do want to thank Farm Foundation for including me uh, in the panel. I really appreciate that. And also thank Keith for moderating the panel. And first off here on this slide, you know, Keith gave you the sort of the working definition. At Dunham Trimmer, we, we found that we really wanted to create a graphic to try and sort of put all these terminologies you hear being used when talking about biological products. You hear biological products, biocontrol, biopesticide, biostimulant, biofertilizer. People talk about the microbial market. They talk about biochemicals. How does it all fit together? And we created this graphic. So on the right-hand side of the screen here in the, in the green colors, you see what are the biocontrol products, the biopesticides and the macroorganisms. These are all used to control either plant diseases or insects pests. Uh, so you have a range of different types of products and it does include microbials as well as plant extracts and the pheromone products uh, that are used in mating disruption. Uh, on the left-hand side, we see what we, we characterize as crop improvement products. And this includes both biostimulants and biofertilizers. And as Keith said, these are used uh, to allow the plant to be more efficient in its uptake of nutrients or water, or to help the plant to better tolerate abiotic stresses that, that are present in the environment. So next slide, please. So how big is this market uh, on a global basis? Uh, we've seen this market grow from roughly about $2 billion in 2012 to more than $7 billion in 2021. And that includes just the biocontrol and biostimulant aspects. And you see there the annual growth rate uh, across this 10-year uh, span is 14.4%. Uh, to put that in perspective, that's about two to three times faster growth than we see in the traditional chemical crop protection market. Some of the things that are driving this growth, we do see favorable government policies, both here in the US and in other parts of the world. In the US, I think the, the most significant uh, government policy was the establishment of the bio biopesticide division at the EPA and a set of regulatory guidelines for approving biocontrol products which recognized what Keith referred to as the fact that they are inherently less toxic to users, to consumers, and to the environment. And, and that uh, happened in 1994, and that really facilitated the, the growth of the biopesticide market here in the U.S. In Europe, we see other government policies. Right now, they're uh, establishing what they call their farm-to-fork policy which has an, uh, an inherent goal of reducing chemical pesticide usage throughout the European Union. Uh, and that is certainly going to have a, uh, an impact on the use of biologicals. Within biocontrol, I would say the single most important driver for the growth of this market has been consumer demand for reduced pesticide residues, especially in fresh market fruits and vegetables. Uh, we see that as being probably the, the single most important factor. Uh, as Keith said, in addition, there are benefits to the growers with, the man, with pest resistance management aspects uh, due to the complex mode of action of these biocontrol products. And with biostimulants, we see the consumers are looking for sustainable production, but they also want those fruits and vegetables especially to be available on a year-round basis. And that puts some additional challenges for the growers to be able to provide and, and produce those crops year round. Uh, and it means that there is a need for the type of uh, product that biostimulants represent, a product that can help that crop tolerate the stresses that occur when it's grown in a, in a time of the year that may be not be optimal. Next slide, please. 
So if we look at the biocontrol segments, and I apologize, there's an error here on this slide. In the top right, it says COGGR 15% to 27%. That really should be COGGR from 2015 to 2027. So I apologize for that error. But uh, here we're looking at the, the growth of the different segments. And we see biocontrol growing towards in excess of $10 billion by 2027. We think biostimulants will reach at least $5 billion by that time frame. So combined, there'll be more than $15 billion globally. Biofertilizers, we're right now developing our, our data set on biofertilizers. We believe the market today globally is somewhere around 1.2 to 1.5 billion. We're still doing a little bit more refining of our numbers before we put a projection there on with the growth rate for that market. But we do see that as a very exciting market. If we look across all these different uses, some, some things cut across the groups. Microbials is definitely an area where we see very fast growth and that impacts all three of these different types of products. We do see some companies that are entering with peptide-based technologies, both as, as biostimulants and as biocontrol. And we see one thing that's happening in the biocontrol area is pheromones. Uh, there's some disruptive advancements in synthesis of pheromones which is going to reduce the cost of producing those products and may open up new crop use opportunities, which have not been open to those types of products due to cost. Uh, lastly, uh, biofertilizers is a segment we see a lot of activity, a lot of innovation, and I'm pretty certain that Karsten's gonna have a few words to say about that later, so I'm gonna uh, let, leave that for him. If we look at both these across all the biologicals, crop protection products, the biostimulants and biofertilizers, really, you know, we see them as tools that help the grower to address threats to production and yield. Uh, the biocontrol products uh, assist with pest resistance management, but also perform quite well in integrated programs with chemicals and allow the grower, especially if they're producing fresh market fruits and vegetables, to produce those that produce with reduced chemical residues to meet the demands of the consumer. With the biostimulants and biofertilizers, we see increasing abiotic stress occurring uh, with uh, you know, high temperatures, with drought, uh, with other uh, extremes environment, which you know, right now many of the growers in the, in the Western part of the US are dealing with uh, currently. Uh, also, we see uh, the need for biofertilizer and biostimulants in addressing sustainable resource management and use. So enhancing that crop's ability to you know, uh, absorb and assimilate nutrition and water in a more efficient manner. So if you can go to my last slide, please, uh, Keith. So what, what's the future look like? So I said, you know, there's a lot of investment, both small and large companies uh, in microbial research. We think there's going to be a lot of uh, activity uh, coming from that area. Within the biostimulant area, we see an increase in, in interest, especially by some of the larger companies. We recently had uh, Syngenta, a major crop protection company, make a major acquisition of a biostimulant company called Balagro in Italy. Uh, and we think that's the tip of the iceberg of uh, the involvement of some of these major uh, crop protection and fertilizer companies in that space. We anticipate an expanded use in row crops, especially with the biofertilizers and the biostimulants, but also we think there's going to be an expansion uh, uh, with biocontrol products being used in those crops, particularly in Europe, uh, due to the farm to fork initiative. And as, as Keith mentioned, uh, the, the use of these products as tools to enhance carbon sequestration and also with nitrogen fixation, uh, which is what Karsten, I'm sure, will be talking about later, uh, are real growth opportunities within the biofertilizer in the biostimulant area that we think is going to help to drive the continued adoption of biologicals. So with that, I look forward to the discussion with the, with the group. Thanks, Mark. As always, I learn something new every time I hear you speak. So thanks. Thanks for that very much. Uh, again, so uh, I would encourage you, if you have questions, go ahead. You can start putting them in the Q&A now. You don't have to wait. We'll get to them after we've been through the, the speakers, but it'd be great if we had some questions queued up so we can jump right in. 
So our next speaker is Laura Lampa from Bayer Crop Science, where she leads the microbial curation group within the biologics technology division. She is responsible for the strategic oversight of large bacterial strain collection, a large bacterial strain collection and automation to drive sustainable and efficient operations within research and development. Her background includes experience in clinical and research settings at large organizations, as well as at startups. She has been with Bayer for close to 14 years. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Laura. Thanks, Keith, for the introduction. And thank you so much for inviting me and Bayer Crop Science to speak to you all today. Um, we can go ahead and advance through the slides. Um, go ahead and advance one more. We'll get right into it. So yeah, the, my agenda today, I'm gonna go over uh, Bayer Crop Science. I'll do a brief introduction, lead you through why biologicals, and then what we've learned uh, from doing our research. So go ahead and advance to the next if you don't mind. Um, just to give you a brief introduction to, as to who we are, Bayer is the world leading agricultural company across product segments and geographies. Um, and just to give you a really quick overview of what the crop science division currently looks like. As far as our sales go, our crop science division posted sales of over 18 million in uh, Euro, that's in Euro, in 2020, um, and sales at crop science advanced by 1.3%. So we saw some good growth. Um, however, in Latin America region, we saw an expansion of soybean and uh, corn acreage, while the U.S. soybean market, you know, recovered from the 2019 flooding impact. Overall growth was limited uh, by the decrease in cotton, fruit, and vegetables demanded caused by COVID-19 pandemic, as well as dry weather conditions in Europe uh, during the spring. As far as our R&D goes, um, with agricultural expertise spanning more than 100 years, uh, we say that we have a solid track record in farm chemistry research, um, and we have a strong leadership in biologicals. The Monsanto acquisition uh, brought leading seed brands and a strong foundation in plant biotechnology traits as well. Um, we're, we <clears throat> believe we're a leading partner to farmers around the world and we're focused on innovation, working with digital applications and cutting edge technologies. Uh, we develop and market broad spectrum and tailored solutions. I believe Keith termed that as integrated pest management. Um, so you'll hear me talk about tailored solutions. It's really the same thing. Um, but we work to bring tailored solutions to farmers that enable greater productivity in a sustainable way. Um, and our research is really aimed at improving agricultural productivity, regardless of where the farm farming is taking place, um, regardless of whether uh, it's a small farm, big farm, um, and or the agricultural practices being deployed. Um, with a projected annual R&D budget of approximately $2 billion over the coming years, you know, Bayer Crop Science is fully committed to remaining an industry leader now and in the future when it comes to agricultural innovation in the lab and in the field. Um, and as you can see on the slide, uh, we are active in <clears throat> all over the world in over 143 countries with over 33,000 employees worldwide. Um, that was the stats as of 2020. Go ahead and advance to the next. So when we talk about um, shaping agriculture and the benefits to farmers, consumers and the planet, um, we, we say here you can see the heart and soul of what our new combined company is about. And these are the three circles that you see on the right hand side. This shows our core solutions. We have the leading seeds and traits biotechnology business. Um, as well as the world's most innovative crop protection portfolio and biological capabilities. And together with the most advanced digital farming platform, um, we've brought that all together within one company. Our purpose is really to shape agriculture to benefit farmers, consumers, and our planets. Um, we are not reacting to what's happening in the industry, but hoping to shape what's happening in, this, in the industry so that agriculture can be part of the solution to some of the world's biggest challenges. Um, and we really set ourselves on a mission to deliver world-class innovation. We know that farmers need innovation, not only to grow enough, but to grow better for our planet and its people. We have leading research capabilities in biology, crop protection, and data science to deliver the tailored solutions to farmers faster than ever before. 
Um, we believe also that collaborating with external partners, um, large or small, can create lasting change for farmers, consumers, and our planet. And I'll have a slide that speaks to that um, open innovation model uh, later on. Um, we're really looking to set new standards and sustainability as well. We believe every investment in innovation should also be an investment in sustainability. So in addition to tech technological advancements, we are equally committed to helping reduce our environmental impact as well as improving the lives of smallholder farmers. Um, we really believe that our long-term success of the company lies not only in selling more products, but in providing farmers with the best tools and solutions so they can achieve better harvests using less water, less land, um, and energy. Um, so in that, uh, you know, we are going to do that. You know, we see our, our ability to execute on all of our deliverables um, by, by being able to deliver on those tailored solutions to farmers. And that really means that we're dealing with variability that is inherent on every single farm and offering the growers a better choice, more suited to their specific needs, as opposed to a standardized one size standard fits all solution. Um, and this is really the essence of what our strategy is all about. You can go ahead and to the next. So as biologic, this is um, basically, we're looking at the definition of biologicals with which Keith already set the uh, foundation for that and provided a nice description. So thank you for that. So I won't go into too much detail on this slide, but ag biologicals typically are uh, topical or seed treatment products derived from or containing natural materials, which can complement or even replace agricultural chemical products. Um, microbials are a solution that farmers can utilize to improve and protect their harvests, no matter what farming practices he or she employs. Um, in the ag world, you'll often hear academics and researchers refer to biologicals as probiotics for plants. Um, that's one of the ways we also like to describe it as well. Um, ag biological products can include inoculants, which promote plant health, <clears throat> improve nutrient uptake. Uh, it can be bioinsecticides, fungicides, et cetera, that complement or replace uh, agricultural chemical products. Um, examples of this are BT sprays, microbial pesticides are naturally, those are uh, pesticides that are naturally derived chemicals. And Bayer has really built up a strong expertise in um, R&D here, production and marketing of biologicals through, just through strategic acquisitions. Um, biologicals are part of the crop science division's crop protection portfolio. Um, and currently, Bayer sells two types of microbial products. We sell inoculant products, which help plants to take up nutrients, and biocontrol products, which help plants to protect against pests and disease. Um, other folks in the industry we know are also looking at applications like weed control as well. We can advance to the next slide. So why do growers need biologicals? Um, you know, efficacy is not the only driver that's rapidly changing the landscape here. Um, we know that there is <clears throat> a lot of uh, pressure to do, oops, sorry, I'm having a little pop up here. We know that there's a lot of pressure here um, in terms of on-farm and off-farm. Uh, there's regulatory pressure that's driving the use of biologicals. Um, as we increase regulatory hurdles, there's limitations in application of small molecules, for example, that are driving this. There's higher costs to register small molecules, which make the business case for biologicals even more um, attractive. We know there's consumer demand. Um, increasingly, consumers care about what's, what's placed in their food. Um, there's increased adoption of biologicals in conventional farming as well. Um, and then the food chain, somebody, um, I believe uh, Mark mentioned, you know, year-round sourcing of, of produce from different countries, really wanting to have that transparency and crop protection products, um, including reduced pesticide load. Um, so for all these reasons, we really believe that um, that biologicals are going to be really a key player in now and in the coming time. Um, let's go ahead and advance to the next. Um, you know, in, in this slide, I would like to just point out um, again, you know, the increasing value uh, of biologicals as a complementary tool for growers. We know already today biologicals are being used in 40 to 70 percent of the crops for disease. Uh, control of disease, insects, and a stimulants. Um, we know that today most growers use biologicals and programs with chemical products, um, and we're expecting this to significantly increase over the next three to five years. Again, just to recap, top grower benefits are efficacy, reduced impact on the environment, and reduced impact on beneficial insects. 
And here is what I was alluding to earlier, this open innovation model. You know, there's so much talent out there. And while Bayer does have a commitment to invest in our R&D, um, like, like I said, $2 billion over the next um, couple of years, we realize that we can't be good at everything. And so we've created a really um, strong network um, of, uh, of collaborations and strategic partnerships across <clears throat> to access new technologies and really have uh, complementary products added to our portfolio. Um, when we talk about our product portfolio, um, we have foliar and soil applied products as well as seed applied products. Um, and we really um, created a product portfolio that addresses a wide range of grower needs, not only in crop protection, but to increase yield um, and provide flexibility and use as well to farmers. The one thing that I'd like to do at the, as a case study or an example of integrated solutions is take you through our um, lighthouse product called Serenade. This is a very effective biological crop, crop protection with integrated benefits. Um, the active ingredient is a soil microorganism. It was discovered in 1995 um, by one of our scientists and it's still being uh, researched today and being found always to have new modes of action. It's a very complex, um, micro, but it's really an effective biological prop, prop protection with integrated benefits, not only to growers, consumers, but to the environment as well. And if you advance to the next slide, I can just show you a little bit about what we mean by integrated solutions. So an example of a tailored solution today would be something that provides holistic and sustainable root health via Root to Success. This is a program that we put out in fruits and vegetables. Um, and this is so that we can drive healthy roots um, to increase yield up to 30 to 50 percent more. Um, we see this as uh, integrated solution as having you know, your, your basic crop protection, your classic crop protection products, but also integrating into that um, serenade and also bioact to heal and activate plant um, defenses naturally. Um, integrated with that, we also can include some of our technology drip by drip, which applies the active substances precisely to the, to the plant resulting in higher efficacy. Um, this leads to the need for less crop protection compound and lower um, environmental impact. Let's see. <clears throat> Another area, um, you know, as I said, we're always evolving our signature product to address urgent issues. Um, one of those is soil health. And so Serenade, um, we've created a new uh, fermentation, optimi we've optimized the fermentation to um, create this concentrated formulation. This is a result, this results in higher spore uh, content as well as reduced use rate. Um, and it was really developed for soil to create faster germination of spores and, and provide more consistent results. Um, and instead of being a foliar spray, again, this is applied to the soil, it's meant to activate the plant's defense mechanism, suppressing diseases, activating uh, root growth and enabling better nutrient uptake um, and providing root protection with an active biofilm that it creates um, around the plant. Uh, so this is just one example of how we're always evolving our, one of our signature products, going from a foliar spray, um, controlling fun fungus diseases um, to a, a, a soil application, helping to provide the soil health and root protection. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna end my talk and thank you for your kind attention. Thanks, Laura. Uh, it, it's actually really exciting for me to hear that a company like Bayer has such a commitment to sustainability and to biological products. So uh, thanks for sharing that with us. Our final uh, speaker this morning is Karsten Temme, uh, CEO and co-founder of Pivot Bio uh, for years. Uh, he has been fascinated with the limitless potential of the unseen microbes that inhabit our world. While earning his PhD at the University of California, San Francisco, his graduate research focused on enhancing the nitrogen fixing potential of soil borne microbes. Driven by the desire to create meaningful change in the world, Karsten partnered with his friend and colleague, Alvin Kamser, to create Pivot Bio. And I'll let Karsten tell you more. Take it away, Karsten. Well, thanks. And uh, maybe I'll start and, 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 and just call out the Maybe the mission that I'm on with my teammates, I, we really want to be able to see uh, every farm be a lot more profitable and, and that the, the practices, the decisions, the products, uh, the crops we grow 
mean that that farm is, uh, it, it has longevity that, that allows us to pass it on to the next generation. And, uh, and at the end of the day, the ripple effect of, of our, our system means that uh, everything around us is a little bit more resilient, both our food supply and, and our global environment uh, and its health. And, and, and for me, my passion is nitrogen, uh, ni the nitrogen cycle, the way that we supply nutrients to our crops, uh, the, the impact of nitrogen, both in, in terms of soil health and clean air and clean water. And, uh, and that's really what, what Pivot is all about is, is nitrogen and how can we better produce and supply the nitrogen that our crops need. Uh, something that, that ultimately is is better performing and yields better results than we've ever experienced before. Uh, so I, 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 I think it's, it's, it's a pleasure to, to kind of give um, maybe one perspective on uh, a challenge and a, a problem that is, uh, is present for every grower on a, an annual basis uh, and also one slice of that, that pie of, of biologicals. Um, Maybe uh, advance to the next slide, and I'll, I'll I'll give a little bit more of a uh, an intro on what Pivot does. Um, for us, uh, the focus is how do we take and and use the relationship between legumes and microbes in the soil. Uh, that symbiosis that allows legumes to self fertilize. How do we make that something that can apply? outside legumes to all the crops of the world, uh, to crops that are the, the cereals that drive the backbone of many of uh, the broad acre row crop uh, operations throughout the US. And, and our approach is, is maybe to, to roll back time, to use uh, nature as inspiration for a new class of products and, uh, and look at the, the crop's own microbiome as a, a a way to be able to produce the nitrogen that that crop needs. Now that's actually the way uh, all plants on this planet obtained the majority of their nitrogen before we invented fertilizer about 110 years ago. Uh, and, and the challenge is that, that we've been able to increase the productivity of our agricultural system through the use of fertilizer and, and many other types of technologies across this last century uh, but it's got uh, a few uh, side effects. One of those side effects is that uh, use of fertilizers has signaled the, the soil microbiome to stop fixing nitrogen for uh, all the crops except for le legumes. And, and what we try to do at Pivot is, is reawaken that portion of the microbiome. Uh, and, and in the process, design a product that performs better than the use of fertilizers. So uh, I, what do I mean by that? I, it's, it's how, do we, uh, how do we make it so that the, the microbes have a better ability to um, produce that nitrogen and get it into the plant? So we're not thinking about how much nitrogen fertilizer we need to apply to a field, but we're thinking about how much nitrogen is put inside of the crop itself. Uh, how do we eliminate some of the challenges and the headaches of, of being able to manage fertilizer today? And, and lead to maybe a, a more predictable um, and, and highly performing uh, operation as a result. So where we're at today as a company, uh, we focus primarily on, on the core cereal grains, uh, corn, wheat, uh, developing products for rice, um, and then any products or any other crops that uh, our customers might rotate into. I, we have been a, a commercially uh, active company in the US for a number of years now. Uh, our products are being used across uh, millions of acres and, uh, and we are laying a foundation to hopefully have an impact around the globe uh, for decades and decades to come. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so what does that mean? How, how can biologicals uh, and specifically nitrogen products uh, perform better than some of the technologies available uh, to, to us as growers today. And, and I think that uh, for us, uh, the way to think about that is, um, is the challenge of, of managing nitrogen is all about uh, timing. Uh, because nitrogen fertilizers are a big and bulky uh, uh, nutrient in their inorganic forms, uh, we have to apply them to the field at, at all the wrong times. We have to store our inorganic nitrogen in the soil 
And that's really the wrong place or the one of the worst places to store nitrogen because it can be lost to the environment. And it can go many places before the crop can actually utilize it and turn it into a, a harvestable yield. And, and uh, microbes offer this alternative. Uh, microbes can uh, live and grow in the roots of the plant uh, and then produce the nitrogen on demand. So uh, instead of fixing nitrogen in a Haberbosch uh, chemical fertilizer factory and then using our, uh, our, our railways, our, our barges um, and, and our supply chains to ship that to a farm, uh, we can have the microbes uh, breathe in the air uh, nitrogen from the air and turn that into ammonia on demand for the crop and then put it directly into the roots of the plant so the plant can turn that into biomass, into DNA, protein, and, and grain, and, and avoid storing that, uh, that ammonia or nitrate in the soil. And in the process, uh, we can have a huge impact on uh, the environment, on the sustainable um, ramifications of, uh, of using fertilizer. So today, globally, uh, about half of fertilizer uh, is turning into some for, a form of air or water pollution. It's, it's simply a side effect of, of uh, needing to use uh, nitrogen fertilizer to power our agricultural system. And, and if we can produce that nitrogen on demand through products like, like Pivot is, um, is building, I, we can eliminate the, the presence of that inorganic nitrogen in the soil. And that means there is uh, there's an absence of nitrous oxide emissions. There's an absence of nitrate runoff into the water. And, uh, and there's ultimately better predictability and better efficiency with uh, getting that nitrogen in the crop and translating it to yield. So that I think um, in, in some ways is, is maybe one of the opportunities for biologicals that, that we can dream up new products and new ways of improving our farming operations because of unique things that biology can do that chemistry can't. Uh, we can eliminate this need for complex uh, factories and supply chains, uh, all the challenges of trying to manage um, how do you apply nitrogen fertilizer and, and predict whether it's gonna be there when the crop needs it and simply shrink that all down into a microbe that, that lives with the plant uh, and, and produces that nitrogen at just the time needs it and then spoon feeds the plant its daily dose of nutrient. Uh, so where are we today? I, I mentioned that we are serving customers. Um, we're in a spot that our first versions of products are, are supplying about uh, a fifth of the nitrogen that a, a corn crop requires. And we plan to be able to, to iterate on that design, to be able to deliver more and more of the nitrogen that that corn crop requires uh, to the point where Microbes can be the, the dominant form of nutrient supply um, for crops around the world. And, and I, I, I think that I, we're excited about what, uh, what can change in terms of how we think about and manage nutrients uh, and, and the way that that integrates with uh, other advances in uh, innovations across the spectrum of biologicals and, and how it fits with the, the other practices that are, are part of managing um, every operation today. So I'm looking forward to the conversation today. Happy to talk about nitrogen and the nitrogen cycle to any extent folks are interested in uh, and, and the implications for biologicals in general. Thanks, Carson. Abby, that's really some exciting and innovative, uh, those different approaches that you, uh, that you share with us. So thanks for sharing that. So we do have a few questions already in the Q&A. Um, we also have some in the chat. And then um, I have a few myth-busting questions uh, that I'd like to share. Uh, so what, I'm going to actually start one, one or two of my myth busters and uh, give folks a chance to continue to put questions into the Q&A. So uh, the first one is, uh, uh, are biological products only or mostly used by organic growers? And maybe, uh, Mark, you could start, the, start us off. Because is, is I hear that from folks. Oh, only organic growers use biologicals. But what's your perspective on that, Mark? Well, you know, I would, I would say, most definitely no, that, that is not the case. Um, what we see when we look at the market is that probably 75 to 80% of all biological use is in conventional acres. Uh, certainly organic growers are early adopters 
they are some of the first to, to try new biologicals. But you know, the growth that we've seen in, in, uh, in this industry, and there just aren't enough organic acres to support that level of sales and, and the growth rate that we've been seeing. So we're seeing a lot of integration of biological products being used in a, in a program together with traditional chemical inputs uh, based on the benefits that they bring. Thanks, Mark. Karsted, Laura, I don't know if you've had any thoughts Do you want to share on that from your experience. Are you are, are you selling to non-organic farmers? I guess is what it is. You know, our, our, our product is is currently <laughs> not uh, labeled for organic use. I uh, and and I think it's it's because we look at our um, our potential impact in the world and and more than half of the world's nitrogen fertilizer is used on just corn, wheat and rice. Most corn, wheat and rice is not organic. And, and so we, we simply wanna be able to have uh, uh, an impact um, in the biggest way possible as fast as we can. So that means uh, by nature, um, what you see from us is, is, is gonna be uh, on conventional acres. Thanks. Yeah, it, 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 it's the same at Bayer as well. Um, you know, our, our main businesses are row crops, um, but also fruiting vegetables. And so Serenade actually is uh, registered or it has organic label on it, but um, moving forward, that's not our target market. We're really aiming to um, be in the conventional market and again, have as big impact as possible. Right. So here's another kind of a myth buster and, and maybe Laura, you can start with this because we hear this from folks. If I use biological products, does that mean I stop using conventional products? What's your position on that? Yeah, absolutely not. I mean, you know, you're not going to necessarily have that efficacy that you're after if you just go with just the biological product. Um, oftentimes we see that it works best in rotation. Again, going back to that tailored solution um, or that integrated pest management solution where you have both conventional and the biological product combined with some sort of, um, you know, digital tools or things like this um, to really to really have as big an impact as possible. So no, we don't see it as a standalone at all for us. Right, right. But again, I get that question. I don't know, Mark or Karsten, anything you want to add? I think it's always going to be the case that I, you know, new products become one more set of tools in the toolbox. And, and flexibility, being able to deal with uh, a, a very dynamic um, growing season is always the name of the game. So I... I, I think what what we've observed is today our product, like I mentioned, it it provides uh, about a fifth of the nutrient uh, requirement by the crop, and and maybe that that balance changes over time. Maybe it becomes eighty or ninety percent of the nitrogen that that the crop requires comes from a pivot product, and at the same time, uh, it the way we manage all of the, the other nutrients, the micronutrients that the, that the crop needs, it, it all becomes um, a balance of a number of different tools, um, both biological and conventional that are um, part of the equation. Right. Okay, so that's it for my, my, my myth busting questions for now. I'm gonna actually go to the Q&A. So hopefully, uh, again, folks continue to put your questions in the Q&A, but hopefully the speakers can see the questions in the Q&A just like I do. So the first one, Given the proven benefits and low risk of biopesticides and the fact that FIFRA is a risk, uh, risk benefit statute, is there more that EPA can do to expedite their path to market? So just so folks know what we're talking about here, FIFRA, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, or Denticide Act, I'm glad I remembered what that is, um, is the federal statute that regulates pesticides, all pesticides, and biopesticides and biological products but specifically biopesticides are absolutely pesticides. So they're subject to FIFRA. Uh, so this question is asking what, you know, what can EPA do to expedite the path to market? Uh, Mark, maybe, maybe you can start us on that one. Uh, as I mentioned, I think, you know, when, on one hand, I will say that EPA had a lot of foresight with the establishment of BPPD back in 1994. Uh, and, and still many other parts of the world have not even taken that step. And, and there's a struggle for biologicals to achieve registration in places like Europe, uh, where they're still trying to regulate with a chemical system. Uh, 
Is there more that EPA could do? Certainly, there's always more that we would like to see, do, see engagement with uh, industry association to help uh, expedite uh, the process of the registration approval uh, so that there's more clarity and understanding between the, the manufacturers and the regulators on what's expected and what needs to be delivered. Uh, and I'm sure Laura can add in a few thoughts on, on that aspect as well. Laura, would you like to? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I, I don't have anything additional to add that Mark said. I would just be echoing what he, what he said as well, so. That, 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 that's fine, I know Karsten, you could be a head nod one way or the other. Okay, well, we'll just uh, move back on to the Q&A. Okay, here's, here's a good one. How would a farmer interested in learning more about these products and how they might be incorporated into her farming program get started? So I can just start with a plug for BPIA, at least learning more about these products. Uh, BPIA can be a great resource. One of the simplest ones is our website, bpia.org, uh, uh, where we have, you know, kind of high level. We don't get into specific product information on our website, but we list all our members and there's links to their website. So you can, you know, use that as a pathway to, to uh, you know, to go to those companies and see all their products listing, et cetera. But, you know, on our website, we can give you kind of high level, you know, basic information. We just posted uh, a wonderful new video uh, that, that we uh, made about uh, biological products in general. It's a, it's a nine minute video, but it's very informative. So I would encourage you to, to go to our website. I would love to hear from our panelists, uh, Again, how, what are good ways for, for uh, farmers to learn about these products and, and really learn about you know, how to incorporate them into their farming programs? I, I don't know, uh, Karsten, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, the, great, great question. I, I, so anybody who wants to learn more about Pivot, uh, pivotbio.com, great place to start. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of great videos on our YouTube channel. I, and then I, an open invite, I email me at any time, uh, Karsten at Pivot Bio, and, and I can connect you um, with folks on my team if I can't answer a question. I, I, I think one of the things we'd like to, to always do is uh, get folks out to see our product in action. Um, we've always got some place nearby uh, within driving distance that you can go and, and see our product in action. You can talk to somebody who is using our products, uh, and and our our team of agronomists uh, is is really um, always excited to, to to chat through uh, the way you manage nitrogen and other nutrients on your your operation today, uh, and and really to understand the the challenges as you experience them. Um, does it come down to to budgeting and planning? Is it about uh, getting access to uh, equipment or the field at, at uh, the right times of the year. Um, and, and then what can we do to help simplify that? Um, either because it's going to be less work when you use our product or, or more peace of mind, um, just that the, the predictability and consistency of nutrient supply and availability is, is, is more dependable. Um, I, I think it's, it, it starts with a conversation and I, um, I you know, reach out to me Karsten at pivotbio.com, um, and, and we'll go from there. That, that, that's great, Karsten. And how about for you, Laura? If a grower or a farmer came to you and said, hey, I want to learn about these products, I specifically want to know how to incorporate these, these products, what, what would your advice be? Yeah, I was going to offer the same thing as Karsten did. You know, reach out to me directly, laura.lampa at bear.com. I can always put you in touch with the right people. Um, you know, since the pandemic, we've had to switch over for to from in-person um, grower demos to virtual. And so we've actually been able to extend our reach significantly with these virtual field tours. Um, a lot of those are recorded and they can be found on YouTube, um, but we're more than happy to walk you through what an integrated um, or a tailored solution would look like for your field. We're more than happy to offer education um, and product information. Um, so please uh, don't hesitate to reach out, go to bear.com or um, you can find us on YouTube. Laura, that's a great uh, point. I've seen some of those virtual field tours and they are amazingly informative. And just to circle back to you, Mark, because Mark, you don't, obviously you're not making these products, but if, if a, a farmer came to you with kind of that same question, where, where would you tell them to look for information? 
Well, I think Karsten and Laura have, have given some great examples of, you know, reach out, look at, look at the company websites uh, where you're already buying chemical products. There's a very good chance that they may be, have biological products within their portfolio. And that could be a starting point for you to engage. I would also say, you know, look at uh, university extension services. In many cases, especially in, in markets where there's a strong fruit and vegetable uh, uh, area, you'll see a lot of biological research going on in, in those areas. Um, and then, you know, very often, yeah, your, your distributor may be able to be a source of information. Your distributor or retailer where you buy your crop inputs already may be able to provide you with some input and some good advice from their agronomist or horticulturalist who can educate you on what they've seen with the, the use of biologicals uh, right in your own backyard. That's great, thanks. So moving on to now we have a very specific question and I will be very impressed if anyone can, can, can answer this specific question. Are any biopesticides or biostimulants accepted by NRCS as part of practice standards utilized in EQIP or CSP? Does anybody know the specific answer to that? I can just say I'm not familiar with the specifics of EQIP and what they uh, you know, uh, recommend as standard practices. Um, certainly biologicals would appear to have a a contribution to their goals, but I just don't know the details there. And I'm kind of in the same boat. So, uh, but I, I'm happy to get that information because I know I'm, our members at BPI, I'm sure they know, but for, for many of them right now, listening are saying, I, I can answer that question. So I will get that information to the Farm Foundation, unless Carson or Laura, if would either of you know, but I, I mean, that's a very specific question, but we will get that information and share that with the Farm Foundation. The next question is for Karsten. So you're on the spot, Karsten, whether you, you like it or not. Has USDA's Comet Farm or other tools factor, factored in the climate impact of your product or similar products in their modeling effort? I, I, I think the, the, the short answer is we could do more. And, and, and maybe the longer answer is uh, for any of the, the types of models out there, um, the, the first approximation is, is what happens if we start using less uh, nitrogen fertilizer? A lot of models uh, address that today. The, the part where we could do more is we're replacing that with a different source of nitrogen. And, and we are continuing to make sure that those nutrients are there to be able to, um, to provide for uh, the requirements of the plant and, 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 and to drive yield and, uh, and marketable grain. And, uh, and I, I think that's the part where there's an opportunity to, to look at um, when we're replacing our source of nutrients and not, and not simply trying to reduce the, the, the amount of excess inorganic nitrate sitting in the, in, um, uh, in the soil, maybe at the detriment of crop productivity. Um, so I, I think uh, for anybody tied into various modeling efforts, um, both related to farm productivity and uh, the ripple effect of uh, impact on, on sustainability, um, both clean air, clean water. I, I'd really like to connect and talk about what we can do together. Thanks, Carson. So our next question, what are the prospects for increasing use of biologicals by smaller scale farmers around the world? So that's kind of a global question. Mark, do you, do you have any insight into that? Um, I guess the first thing I'd say is, you know, you know, you know, we have to think, what do we mean by smaller scale? Are we talking about farmers in developing countries? Uh, or are we talking about farmers in, in other countries where the, the size of farms is much smaller than we're accustomed to in the U.S.? If we're talking about developing countries, you know, one thing I always caution against is if a, if a grower in a developing country is still struggling with basics like seed and fertilizer, you know, he's probably not ready to start adopting biostimulants yet. <laughs> he's got to solve the basic needs of, of producing a crop first. Uh, but, uh, you know, if we're talking about smaller growers, we do see a lot of uh, uh, innovation and use of biologicals coming out of small, small landholder farmers in Southern Europe. 
for example. Um, really, the biostimulant industry emerged from Southern Europe uh, as uh, growers there, fruits and vegetables, were looking for tools uh, to solve problems that they had in producing uh, fruits and vegetables year round. So it's, it's, a, you know, it's a little bit different depending on the, what kind of small farmer you're talking about. Uh, but you know, I don't think there's any barrier to a smaller producer uh, you know, being able to use biologicals. It all depends on, on what it, what's the problem they're trying to solve, what crop are they trying to grow, and how can they be integrated into his system to, to help him succeed. You know, I, Mark, I'll, sorry, please I'll build go. on that and, yeah, please. and say, you know, I, I think part of it comes down to the different challenges that, that growers around the world face. Um, you know, just the, the, the nature of how we, we manage every operation, the, the equipment available to us, the supply chains available to us, it, it's so different that I think the design of the product, the way it's used that has to be very specific to the local challenges. And so the way we've designed our product, the way it integrates into farming practice in, uh, in the US is entirely different than something that is, is gonna solve a very unique challenge for a grower um, farming uh, less than a hectare in Sub-Saharan Africa. And, and those are maybe the farthest two ends of the spectrum. So for us, I think that the exciting part is the microbes themselves uh, can have a huge benefit in every type of farming operation. Getting those, uh, those molecules of nitrogen into the crop at just the right time, that, that can benefit everybody, whether you're trying to um, manage thin margins on broad acre row crops in the US or uh, really uh, close the yield gap in, in a smallholder um, operation. And at the same time, we're shrinking the, the physical footprint of a, a, a way to, to produce and deliver nitrogen from tons of bulky inorganic uh, nitrogen fertilizer to something that's, that's like baker's yeast and you can hold in your hand. And that means it, it makes a lot of the supply chain challenges in uh, many parts of the world uh, just disappear. So uh, I, the, I think the, the big challenge ultimately comes down to how do you package and design that product so it's easy to use uh, given such a diverse range of available equipment and, and practices? Um, that, that, that's the place where I spend a lot of time with my team. Thanks, Laura. Anything you'd like to add before we move on? Yeah, I was just going to add, you know, Bear, one of one of our initiatives, we do have a small uh, smallholder farmer initiative where we're going in and one of our objectives is to empower smallholder farmers to reach their full potential, right, by, by fostering that reliable growth for their business or communities. Um, and we're currently doing a pressure test actually within the company to see how can we actually be able to deliver on that promise. Um, this could be anything from creating opportunity um, or access to funding, um, access to the supply chain, um, going in and offering PPE to these uh, smallholder farmers, offering education, um, just as a way to build that relationship and eventually expose them to um, biologicals within their crops. So um, this is something that we're actually very seriously looking into right now. That's great, Laura. And again, I think that demonstrates your company's commitment uh, to you know, getting biologicals uh, more established. Here, here's a good question, at least an interesting one to me. What do you see as the biggest regulatory issues facing the industry going forward? Also, do you see a region like the EU leading regulation or will each region act separately? I definitely have some thoughts on this, but I, I want to hear from the panel first. And, and maybe Mark, maybe you could start us off on that. Well, in the second half, I mean, who's leading innovation here in, in terms of regulatory? On the biocontrol side, I'd say it's definitely the US. Um, the U.S. has been in the leadership role in, in establishing uh, the, a biocontrol system. On biostimulants, EU is in, in, in the lead in establishing a framework for approving uh, biostimulants uh, as unique crop inputs that are different from fertilizers and different from, uh, uh, from pesticides. Uh, but uh, as you alluded to in, in your opening comments, Keith, uh, the U.S. And, and USDA and EPA are both actively involved in uh, addressing these regulatory uh, systems for biostimulants within the U.S. Uh, so we see that uh, the, uh, coming in the near future here in the U.S. as well. 
I do think that each each country or each region is probably going to adapt and take ideas from the other parts of the world as they set up their own systems. It's always a challenge for the manufacturers then is how do I develop a global product and meet all the regulatory requirements around the world. So they always hope to see harmonization of regulatory requirements. And of course, it, it almost never happens that we have global harmonization. Uh, there's always unique requirements in certain parts of the world. Uh, so that's a challenge that the, the manufacturers have to face. And that's probably the biggest challenge, I would say, uh, right now is that, you know, it is not you know, a one size fits all where you know, Karsten and Pivot can develop one registration package and then send it to every country in the world and feel confident that you know, he's going to have, a, have met all their requirements. Uh, there are unique needs in Brazil versus the US versus Europe that are going to impact how quickly some of these technologies come to uh, come to be commercialized in those parts of the world based on their regulatory systems. Uh, and that's probably the biggest challenge for manufacturers is, is working through that that matrix of regulatory requirements. Thanks, Mark. Laura, for you, from your perspective, what's the what do you see as the biggest regulatory issue for your industry? You know, I think the path to registration is really clear when we're talking about um, uh, just a microbial based product uh, based on the microbe itself, based on spores in the product. Um, that's very clear for us. I think when we get into these uh, other areas of new technologies or even what does it look like when it's, you know, the chemistry that we're trying to market in and not necessarily the live microbe maybe the path to regulate uh, regulatory is, is a little bit um, less clear. And so, and, and that's less clear in different regions, right? Every single area has their own um, requirements. And so I think this is the biggest hurdle is just like Mark said, there's not a one size fits all um, dossier that you can submit. It's just really region by region at this point, so. And Karsten, for you, for her company that's you know, striving to take a new approach, be innovative, what do you see as, as the big regulatory issues? Uh, maybe maybe I'll push back and say I think issues is 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 the wrong word. And and it, there's there's obviously things we can always do to make um, make it easier and faster for innovation to reach the the growers that can benefit from it most. Uh, but I also think there's there's this opportunity to say I we can look at at potential policy. Um, to, to help uh, connect what happens on the farm with, uh, with more stakeholders around the world. So does that mean there's better ways to link uh, the, um, the sustainability advancements on every acre with, uh, with different industries that, uh, that might be polluting industries? Lots of types of uh, policy efforts right now to, to think about opening access to um, uh, to, to carbon markets or clean air and clean water. Um, same sort of thing when we talk about how do we, maybe how do we shrink that connection, that distance between uh, everybody, uh, all of us as general consumers and, and the champions of our agricultural system who are, are really producing the, the food we eat and the, um, the other uses of, uh, of agricultural products as, as you know, feed, fuel, fiber, and, and, and the whole mix. So I, I look more in, in, in the ways we can make things a little bit more efficient in getting the best ideas out there. Uh, biologicals are this new slice of innovation that can deliver something we've never had before. And, and then can we, can we make everybody who could be a stakeholder a little bit more connected into the, uh, the agricultural system around us? Absolutely. I think that, that's a, a great response. Okay, so going back to our uh, Q&A. All right. Is there a track? Whoop, is there a track to enter biologicals into ecosystem markets for things like water quality and greenhouse gases? Are there any metrics that exist or are in development? I'm going to go right back to you, Carson, because I think that's a, a little bit in your wheelhouse. It, it, it's a great question. And, and we are at the earliest phases of what's possible. I, I think that there is um, there is a a growing uh, opportunity and a number of participants in um, the the MRV section of sustainability measure um, report validate 
Uh, there's also a, a, a very early set of connections between um, the, the various ecosystem markets and what happens on every acre. Uh, for me, the, the two biggest possible things that we could be looking at um, is, is nitrous oxide emissions and carbon sequestration. Uh, another big one is, is methane emissions. Um, and, and, and then uh, obviously the, uh, the, the other one is, is runoff into uh, water quality, both uh, fresh and salt water. And, and in all of those cases, it's the, the earliest of, of where uh, I think we can go. So that means there's a lot of opportunity for folks who've never talked before to figure out how to um, find the best way to solve a problem. Um, and, uh, and, and really be able to, um, to package up the visibility on product use, on practices, uh, into um, verifiable information and, and um, something that's easily digestible by everybody who could be a, a stakeholder in the process. Thanks. Mark, kind of from a global perspective, I mean, obviously greenhouse gases, water quality could be a local issue, but it's also a global issue. Uh, this idea of uh, entering biologicals into the ecosystem markets, any thoughts? Well, there's certainly a lot of, lot of interest uh, from the, I would say the, uh, the, the company and the sort of association level. And I know there's member companies within BPIA and within Europe as well who are actively engaged uh, with, with other groups in uh, what Karsten referred to is trying to uh, establish the MRB uh, value of, uh, bio and, and of introducing biologicals into a production system, whether it be a biostimulant, a biofertilizer, biocontrol, and those are the, the key things that have to happen in order to, to get to where Alex is talking about in his question. Uh, so I think there's a lot of discussion, a lot of uh, engagement going on in that area, uh, but it, it's gonna take some time until we uh, get to the point where we've fully uh, accounted for what the con contribution these products can make uh, to achieving these goals. Thanks. L Laura, anything you wanna add? Um, no, nothing that I would add, only, only that, um, you know, Bayer is really invested in also uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, um, creating, uh, creating infrastructure um, to provide financial opportunities to growers um, and help them to, to recoup some of the money by, by creating those carbon credits. So um, this is a, a program that's ongoing right now and that's uh, launched last year. Right. Okay. Now here's here's a very uh, a kind of real world question. Uh, it, what starts off with thanking you all because uh, this grower is finding this uh, informative, but uh, she would like to know what is the approximate grower cost per acre for these products, Pivot Bio products and Serenade, et cetera. And, and Mark, maybe you can also kind of uh, in more generally, but does anybody want to uh, share that th th their, that uh, number or, or however you want to address that? You know, I don't have that at the at the um, top of my head. I, I should know it. I, I do know where the information is. I, so I can actually get back if, if that's very interesting for you to know, I can get back with that information um, at some future time. No, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll just say uh, our, our philosophy at Pivot is we want to make it so that our products, uh, you're, you're spending uh, the same amount of money you would spend on, on managing the rest of your nitrogen budget. Uh, simply trying to, to shift the, the place you spend your dollars. And, and the benefit is that you get a more uh, consistent and highly performing uh, source of nitrogen that you don't have to worry that that might be lost to the environment and, and not there when the crop needs it. I, one of the other, I think, nice things is we see commodity prices um, swing, and especially on the fertilizer side, and, and being able to know Pivot's going to deliver one consistent price um, all the time. Uh, hopefully, that's an advantage that, that, that folks really appreciate over time. I, instead of throwing out a specific price per pound or price per acre, I, I'd say our team is, is always working to try to incentivize um, more rapidly converting uh, acres to using our product. So lots of ways to be able to, um, to reduce the, the price point a, a bit. 
So uh, reach out to me. Um, key anchor point though is the philosophy is I uh, this this should be something that uh, it it costs the same as the the nitrogen products you use today. Uh, when we're talking about how how you get that nitrogen into the crop. Thanks, Mark. But for you, have you looked at kind of cost per acre comparing biologicals to conventional, for example? I mean, do you have any insight there you can share? Yeah, definitely. We've looked at that, and and, and the short answer is is biological costs are across the entire spectrum of costs for for other crop inputs. There are some biologicals that are very economical and compete extremely well with their chemical uh, counterparts. There are other biologicals that are premium priced and therefore are restricted to only high value markets because of, of that premium pricing. So really they, they fall across the entire spectrum. And uh, you know, it's, it's hard to say, you know, there's an exact price point where this is where biologicals fall because they're across the full range of, of costs that you would see with it, it's similar to what you see with chemical products. Right, and that makes sense. Okay, the next one, are there results describing how biostimulants thrive in different field soil environments? I mean, maybe I can start off with, I mean, I just know from my members who make these kind of products, yes, absolutely. I mean, it depends on the, on the product, but certainly uh, there's biostimulant products that have been tested in different uh, field soil environments. I, I don't know, does anybody have anything they wanna add to that? Maybe, maybe I'll take a bit of a, a contrarian view and in, in the answer always comes back to the design of the product, um, and 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 maybe there's some um, some historical experiences that uh, putting a microbe maybe into a, a a farming practice that that microbe isn't uh, isn't used to living in means it's likely to die quickly and then its efficacy goes away rapidly. Um, the, the approach we take at Pivot is to to use microbes that are naturally part of the crop's own microbiome. So there's a, a symbiosis between the crop and those microbes. And the, the microbe is really uh, living off of sugars that are produced by the plant. So during photosynthesis, about 30 or 40% of the carbon that is fixed is turned into sugars and exuded out the roots to feed microbes in the soil. That's what our microbes, um, our products are, are surviving on. That, that really is the energy that drives nitrogen fixation and allows the microbe to give some of that ammonia back to the plant. And, and that barter, that exchange between crop and, and microbe means that there's, uh, there's a consistent relationship, uh, a consistent performance of our product uh, in all the places that, that you might be growing corn. So we see our customers run into to issues um, more frequently with uh, being able to produce a, a healthy crop um, because of flooding or drought or um, being on some of those marginal lands that, that, that don't necessarily um, have the right pH uh, uh, levels um, before we see a, a, a shortcoming on performance of our products. And I, I, I think it, it just always comes down to like, how do we design um, the, the particular slice of biologicals that we talk about? Thanks. Uh, I think that's right. Here's here's a I like I love questions like this. So I hopefully we can get a good response. As a farmer, I've been approached many times to buy a variety of biologicals that are you know claiming to be as good as, as sliced bread, but without any solid research that gives consistent return on investment. So far, <clears throat> excuse me, I have the opportunity to spend my my you know I'm being asked to spend my tight cash flow without any guarantees. Laura, wh what do you say to a farmer like that? They've been approached in the past with folks saying, "Hey, here's my magic bugs in a jug. Trust me, it's going to solve all your problems." And you know they said, "No, I'm not going to spend money on, on that." What do you say to that farmer? Yeah, you know I, I think that's a that's a really good point. There are a lot of products out there on the market that you can use today, um, right? I think when when you look at what you're going to invest your money on, you have to ask, you know, how much research has been put into that? What's the data to back it up? Um, you know, Bayer has that data. Bayer believes in our products. We don't have anything on the market that we believe is going to fail. And again, going back to that tailored solution idea, 
you know, we're not going to recommend a biological for your field if we don't believe it's going to have any benefit or efficacy there. Um, just like Karsten was was talking about, you know, maybe maybe they perform better when you have some sort of abiotic stress or something like that in your field. Um, but if conditions are great, you know, there might not be any point of having a biological. I think that um, in order to be able to confidently invest your money in biologicals, it's really important to have that relationship um, with whoever your provider is um, and to know, to have that confidence in that product. Um, and that's something that, that Bayer does offer and we hope is an industry standard. Karsten or Mark, go ahead. You know, I, I think it's, it's, it's a, a great um, point to make and, and it, it's also something that um, the the more I the more we can uh, hold new innovation um, uh, to a higher standard, uh, the more we can uh, create new opportunities to see um, products in action or get insights on every acre that we didn't have previously. I, I think the better the the knowledge base is um, to help uh, all of our operations just work better. So. Uh, there's maybe kind of two buckets that I, I see a lot of questions um, fall in, either that I receive or that, that my team receives. And one of those is we've talked about nitrogen fixation for cereal crops for a hundred years. It's been this elusive holy grail. How do we know that Pivot is, uh, ha has broken through? How do we know that this, maybe this class of products is going to be like Pivot is providing, um, that, that it, it really is, uh, it is what we've all been um, seeking uh, both academically, agro agronomically, um, in practice in the field, and and I, I think we've got a lot of great data there to, um, to to help convey that story to be able to show that it's it's uh, microbes taking in sugars from the plant, producing the the key enzymes for um, making nitrogen fixation possible, and then sharing that ammonia back with the plant, all the way down to the molecular level. Uh, the the next bucket I think is. What does that mean for my operation? How do I see a product in action? Uh, most of the way that products uh, get evaluated is, is based on their impact on yield, but what does it mean to more effectively put nitrogen into the crop? Um, if, if we've always stopped at, at asking the question, is my fertilizer performing and my measurement is how much did I apply to a field? There's a big disconnect there because we, we don't have really uh, effective ways to say how much of that nitrogen that got applied to a field ended up in the crop. How much was there to fuel the potential to produce yield? And, and I think uh, that's the part that I think gets really interesting. Um, and in the place we try to spend a lot of time with our customer base is uh, if we can walk fields with growers, if we can help highlight ways to see nitrogen in action, to see that uh, you use our products, you have more peace of mind that nitrogen is in the crop. It's setting the crop up to be able to produce yield. Uh, that's, that's I, I think, hopefully going to mean every, uh, every grower we, we interact with is uh, a little bit more informed or has a few more tools uh, at their disposal um, after that conversation. Thanks, Carson. And Mark, I do I actually do want to get your perspective on this because you don't manufacture these products, you don't sell these products. What do you tell a farmer who if if they were to ask you this question? Well, I, I guess the first thing I say is I grew up on a farm, so I really you know, I can understand Tim Tim's question here, and I absolutely you know, agree with him that if if a you know, manufacturer or you know a distributor cannot provide you with evidence that the product performs, you shouldn't be investing in it. Um, and that's a responsibility for them. Um, and you know, I, I, on the, I also would say that as a consultant who works with a lot of companies, I always sort of cringe when I have a client, if I go to their website and they have some outlandish claim like use my product and your yield will increase by 50%. Um, you know, that's just not realistic. Uh, and it's in, in, in that those kind of promises are what I call over promise under deliver kind of promises. You know, it may occur in certain cases, but chances are no single product is going to have that impact. I will say, though, that, you know, it's important as the user to recognize that you may have to adjust some of your practices to get the a biological product to perform optimally. 
so for example, if you're using a biological insecticide versus a chemical insecticide, a biological insecticide may require you to apply earlier. The economic threshold for using a biological may be lower. Uh, so if, if you're used to applying based on a chemical approach, you may find that the biological doesn't perform as well at the same timing. Uh, same with biostimulants. I mean, if you're using a soil amendment like a humic acid product in order to improve the, uh, the, the water holding and nutrient holding capacity of your soil, you're probably not going to see a return on investment from that treatment in year one. Uh, that's more likely to be something that you'll, you'll reap benefits over time as you use that product then have an immediate return on investment. So there's a little, a few differences that you have to take into consideration as you evaluate this product. But I, I absolutely, you know, would say to Tim that, you know, if, if the person who's trying to sell you a new product can't provide that evidence, then you absolutely should not invest in it. Uh, and I think, uh, I think Karsten and Laura would say, yeah, we, we will provide you that evidence because we stand behind our products and understand how they work. Uh, so those are the kind of companies that you want to seek out and try to uh, evaluate how their products fit in your production uh, system. Some really good advice, Mark. So thanks for that. So next question, and I like this one, what are the key barriers to adoption of these technologies as you see it? I want to start off that what I see it's awareness. I mean, we're getting some of that today, but I mean, certainly in my role at BPIA, if farmers are just not aware that either these products exist, the types of products, what, where they can be used, and the efficacy of these products. I have many members who've had products on the market, success, or they've been selling these products, market, products that work for decades. But again, if, if farmers or growers, if you're, they're not aware of these products and, and their track record, I, I see that as you know, probably the big, biggest uh, barrier, but I would love to hear, Laura, what do you see uh, as the barriers to adoption for these technologies? I, th I think you hit it on, on the head there where you said it's just about um, awareness of the product, how to use the product. Um, you know, again, going, going back to, to Tim's statement, you know, why should I invest in this? You know, asking for that evidence and, and seeing the results. I think that's really important. I think just having the exposure to it is, is key to adoption. Karsten, Mark, what are your thoughts? I, I, I really believe that, that if, if any innovator is, is going to be successful, life has got to get easier for the customer. And, and so for us, um, that means how we, can we reduce barriers? How can we make it so that uh, using our product means it's a lot easier um, day to day than it is to use the incumbent forms of nitrogen fertilizer. Maybe that's you know, less trips to the field, less equipment, uh, and uh, less, less uncertainty when it comes to the equations of predicting whether nitrogen is there. And at the flip side, I, I don't think that alone my team is going to be the, the only place that uh, a potential customer comes for information. And so I think the more that we work with uh, other folks who are already part of your, your ecosystem, your social network, uh, to be able to you know, hold our product to account or to, to be able to... I, I, explore and understand how our products integrate into what you do today. I, the more you can get that information from people who aren't at Pivot, the better off uh, everybody is. And, and so I, I think part of what we try to do is, is work either with uh, universities or with uh, independent parties to test our product, um, to be able to, to help um, uh, ask new questions or provide new measurements that, that could surface some of that data um, uh, for, for any potential customer or stakeholder. Uh, so I, for me, it's, it's how do we reduce barriers just like the actual use of product? And then how do we, uh, how do we best make sure that a lot of people who, uh, who aren't part of each innovating entity um, can be part of the conversation? Thanks. Mark, anything you wanna add? I think the only only addition I would have is sort of is very closely related to what you said, Keith. In addition to awareness, it's, it's for the small small company that has a unique and innovative technology. Is 
having them have the resources to get that product to market, uh, to, to get through the regulatory process, but also to, you know, being able to provide and, and commercially deliver that product, uh, not just across the entire US, but maybe in other parts of the world as well. In many cases, we see for smaller companies that, you know, where it's the proverbial two guys in a garage came up with a great idea. How do they make that a reality? And, and, and that, is, that is a challenge we see because this is a highly fragmented uh, business compared to the traditional crop protection chemical area where we have four major companies that really dominate the industry and, and biologicals, it's literally hundreds of companies. So, you know, some of the, the smaller companies struggle to really expand beyond their local home market. And that there often are some very good uh, innovative ideas there that uh, may not reach the market uh, on a global basis. Thanks, Mark. So let's move on to, okay, here's a good one. USDA is very focused on greenhouse gas impact of emerging technologies. Does BPIA or others have estimates of the greenhouse gas impacts of these products by mode of action? So I'll start with the short answer is BPIA does not, but uh, this year we joined the Food and Agricultural Climate Alliance, which is a kind of a cross-sector group that's working on climate issues. A BPI is in the process of setting up, um, I think we're gonna call it like our climate change task force to specifically look at these kinds of things. We've talked about maybe commissioning some type of study. I know some of our individual members have already had st studies done looking at their products, but I think, again, Carson, I think this one's kind of in your wheelhouse. What can you tell us about this? Sure. Well, I, you know, I, I think uh, USDA has great data on uh, the impact of nitrous oxide emissions on greenhouse gas emissions. I think was, I, last I saw was maybe somewhere around 6% of total uh, emissions in terms of CO2 equivalent are linked back to nitrous oxide. Um, it's an easy way to remember uh, the numbers we use at Pivot. Uh, for every pound of nitrogen we deliver into the crop, that's, uh, that's potentially uh, three pounds of CO2 eliminated from the manufacturing and transportation of fertilizer, uh, six pounds of CO2 equivalent uh, in the form of nitrous oxide emissions that have been prevented, and another pound and a half of nitrate that doesn't enter our waterways. So that's, that's kind of the ballpark of, uh, um, I, potential impact from pivot and and I, I think uh, uh, opportunity to be able to engage uh, anybody who can help us uh, routinely uh, I, I measure that report that out integrate that into software um, or anybody's algorithms uh, that's uh, that's potentially some some big impact thanks Laura mark anything else you want to add on that one okay. Uh, next one, where are most of the new innovations in agriculture or uh, biologicals coming from? Is it universities? Is it small startups? Is it large corporate labs? I'm going to go to you, Mark, first on that. Where do you think that we're seeing the most innovation? Well, first, I would say, I mean, we see innovation coming from all those areas. Uh, but, you know, we see more, probably more innovation from you know, smaller companies. Sometimes they're spinoffs from universities. Uh, where uh, you know, a grad student or professor you know, spins off a company based on, on their research activities. And we certainly see innovation occurring at the large companies as well. But I think the, the real major hub comes from those small startup companies that someone you know, has an idea, uh, they have a concept, they're passionate about it, and they drive that forward. Uh, and, uh, and we see, you know, as I said, there's literally hundreds of companies in this space of the biological agriculture area, and each one of them has a passionate innovator at their heart who really started it. Carson, Alara, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I really appreciate that question. And, and I would agree with Mark. We see a lot of the innovation coming from those small startups. Um, you know, Bayer, of course, we see ourselves as a leading innovator in the space as well. Um, but part of being that innovator is, is acknowledging that you know, we can't do everything ourselves internally, even though we do have heavy investment in R&D, we've created a really great network going out, creating strategic partnerships with these smaller startups. 
um, whether that means just helping them to do, you know, what we're good at, fermentation expertise, formulation expertise, getting path to regula regulatory, um, field testing, you know, just helping to get that product onto market or turn that technology into a product. You know, that's how we're helping with the innovation as well. Right. Maybe I'll, I'll add a, a comment or two, and that's to say, you know, maybe why, why is there an opportunity for a lot of innovation in biologicals right now? And, and how can we uh, help get some of those best ideas in the hands of more growers faster? Uh, I, I, I think this is a very interesting time from a scientific perspective, an academic perspective, because we have a lot of new tools for understanding uh, the microbiome of, of crops, um, both uh, in the above ground uh, tissues of, of plants and, and what lurks below the soil. We can peer below the soil more than we ever have before and understand all of these microscopic living and breathing components of soil. And we have the ability to uh, do a lot of computation on the, uh, the mysteries of DNA and genomes and what that means and, and what the really the, the mode of action is for how microbes interact with plants. And, and there's, there's an opportunity when it comes to synthetic biology, the use of of CRISPR technologies to, to enhance some of the, the, the best properties out there. So a lot of things that are all possible, um, uh, new uh, ways to get insight into the challenges and potential tools to apply to solutions. Uh, and, and so how do we, how do we maybe uh, help innovators or, or um, uh, help advance innovations? I, I think Speaking from Pivot's experience, some of the things that have been most influential for us is, is the ability to, uh, to, to connect um, folks at the cutting edge of the science uh, with uh, everybody who is on the field every day, seeing uh, the, the friction of what it means to manage an operation and, and kind of talking about the problems in real time. Or for us, uh, interacting with other uh, incumbents in, in industry to understand how industry and supply chains work, where some of the challenges and headaches are that uh, maybe a big organization like, uh, like Bayer faces. And, and that ability to get connected in new ways and just openly talk about the things that are hard to do, um, it, 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 it's been a great way to, to catalyze new ideas. So Everybody who's willing to, to talk about the, the problems you face, uh, big hats off. That uh, from an innovator perspective is, is maybe one of the, um, the most uh, impactful things you could be doing. Thanks, Carson. I love this next question. It starts off with, I'll admit, I've been checking my email during this webinar and I received an email about some biologicals for the green industry. So it's asking flowers, transplants, horticulture, are you folks involved in that too? So I'd love to start this off. The answer is absolutely. And I think it goes to awareness. So first of all, a big shout out to our friends of American Hort. They have their big uh, Cultivate event coming up, the biggest ornamental uh, new trade show that I'm aware of. We'll have a dozen BPI members who have booths at that event because they absolutely have products uh, for, for the ornamentals market. At BPA, we actually have a committee, uh, it's called our Specialty Markets Committee. So they deal with things like ornamentals, uh, forestry, public health, now industrial hemp, all these other categories. There's many other categories uh, where biologicals are used. So I, I, and again, it's just, a, it's an awareness issue. We need to make you all aware. So maybe Mark, maybe you could add a little bit on the, the other, uh, for what we think of the non-traditional markets or the specialty markets or, or those other markets that there are biological products for. Yeah, definitely. And, and I agree with everything you said there, Keith. I mean, I, when, I, when I saw this question, I was thinking, okay, there's a huge number of rooting medias that are used in, in production of nursery uh, crops that very many of them incorporate biostimulants and biocontrol agents. Uh, uh, so so it, they're, and they're used in biocontrol for insecticides and for uh, disease control. So there's a wide range of things. In addition to, you know, the the, this, the commercial green industry, of course, there's use of biologicals in the home and gar garden uh, area and in turf uh, in, a, in a significant area. 
man, to go to your local um, garden shop or you know your Lowe's or your Home Depot, you're going to find biological products on the shelf for the home and garden uh, uh, user. So uh, there's a lot of use in, in this area, and and I think it's a lot of the benefits they bring in terms of user safety, environmental safety, uh, are a big draw into uh, many of these markets. Thanks, for Mark. Uh, go ahead, Karsten, please. Yeah, for, for Pivot, uh, we need uh, a partner to help us bring uh, any of our innovation to market in, in those spaces. So we're, we're going to be focused on go to market for the broad acre crops, we're going to need uh, somebody to help us um, do that last mile and, and, and connection with growers and customers um, out, outside of the, the, the major row crops. Thanks. Laura, do you want to uh, anything about the different markets that, that uh, you either that your company's providing biologicals for or you're just aware of? Yeah, yeah, biologicals are, you know, in fruit and veg, but we're also in ornamental as well. We're looking into row crops. Um, so we're we're touching all of the, the major markets. And again, like I said, BPI, our membership, you know, they have uh, products really across the spectrum for all these different markets. So our next question, how should farmers uh, go about testing, trialing these products. What is a good process for determining their potential fit for a farming operation? I'm going to go back to you, Laura. Again, if a farmer comes to you and says, hey, I want to try these. I've never used them before. I want to try them. I, I want to uh, trial it. I want to test it. Uh, you know, what's the process? What's your advice for that farmer? Yeah, you know, I know that Bayer has gone into to farm, uh, on farm where where exactly that we will we will actually set up um, tests for you um, to show the efficacy um, before you invest in our product. So it is something that that you know we have the capability to do. And Carson, is it the same for you, or, or what would your advice be? Yeah, give us a call. Uh, we'll we'll help you both uh, work through your maybe your nitrogen uh, budget or the the approach you take today. Uh, and and hopefully we can give you a few new um, tips or tools for being able to, to measure nitrogen in action on that acre. I know we are, uh, we have to speed up a little bit because we don't have all day. We have a lot of questions. I want to try to get to as many as I can. So the next one, Carson, is specifically for you. Uh, can you walk us through the economics of the biologics for nitrogen as compared to conventional? What is the delta for the farmer? Yeah, I, so it's easy. I spend the same on nitrogen. I, here's where the benefit comes in. Um, our product gets applied at planting, either uh, in for O or potentially someday as a seed treatment, which means you, you are going to uh, have fewer times you need to get into the field to, to manage your nitrogen. Hopefully that means you're eliminating passes through the field, potential equipment you need to either buy, maintain, or rent. Uh, and, and ultimately you have more peace of mind that, that, it, that our product is delivering consistent, stable nitrogen each and every day. And it's not producing it until the stages of the crop life cycle when nutrient uptake and requirements are highest. So you're not banking inorganic nitrogen in the soil lost to the environment. And, and I think what you'll see is that means there's a more consistent uh, set of performance across that acre. I, it might mean that there's an opportunity to I, I reduce the amount of over fertilization or I conversely, I raise the yield floor across all parts of the acre. So uh, there might be some opportunity for uh, yield benefits, um, nothing that I'd, I'd want anybody to base economics around, but it, uh, the goal here is, is pay the same for nitrogen and, and end up with a more consistent, dependable, I, I result in getting that nitrogen in the crop every single year. Thanks, Carson. I, I think that's a great answer. So let's keep moving on. Um, so what percent of farmers do you feel, in quotes, trust the efficacy or mode of action of biological products? I'll say not enough from my perspective. Is it different than legacy products? How do you bridge this when selling your products uh, side by side in trials, university trials, et cetera. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure you can all answer this. So I'll, I'll just go in order. Mark, what's your response to th these questions? Well, I think it, it, it varies obviously by the type of crop and the area where the grower is located um, as to you know, how, 
how much exposure they've had to biologicals, how much they've seen and used biologicals already on their farm. If you're a, a corn and soybean grower in Northeast Iowa, you may not have ever used a biological or maybe you know, it's been on a seed treatment and you don't even realize you used it. Whereas if you're a strawberry grower in, in California, you probably are using a large number of biologicals. So there's a there's a different level of experience, understanding, and exposure among the grower community, depending on what kind of grower you're talking about. But I, I think one thing I would caution against being it's biologicals are not an uh, uh, an either or. It's not a chemical replacement. It's these are products that are integrated with chemical programs to make both products work better and to enhance the produ productivity for the grower. And when growers come in with that attitude that, okay, this is a tool that I'm gonna integrate into what I'm doing, uh, rather than a tool that I'm gonna use to replace chemicals, uh, I think uh, yeah, they end up at a, at a much better place than thinking that it's a replacement issue. Uh, so so that was, was sort of the one, some of the thoughts that came to my mind of reading this question. Right, Mark, I always say, you know, don't look at biologicals as a silver bullet. They're part of the solution. I, th I think that's the point you're trying to make. Karsten, how would you respond to some of these questions about the, the, the trust and, you know, how, how do we build that trust with the growers? Uh, you know, if I'm, if I'm counseling any new entrepreneur that's coming to me for advice, you know, saying, how do I kind of build my company? I, I'd say focus on on clearly communicating your mode of action and show data like out in the real world on how that mode of action is working and separate that from how you're going to make the economic case for buying your product. Um, so that there's not this black box that says the only reason you buy my product is because it has a big question mark impact on yield. And, and if, you, if you can talk about mode of action and then you can clearly show separately, the economics um, will be in a much better place uh, when it comes to trust and, and then thinking about how any new um, product fits into the toolbox. Right. And Laura, for you, I mean, obviously your company sells conventionals and biologicals. How, how do you bridge? How, what, what's the connections, if there are connections that you try to make? You know, you know, I think it's just building that robust data package um, and, and being able to clearly explain, you know, what is the variability that we're seeing? What is the data? What is the mode of action? What are the best candidates in our pipeline for your particular field, for example? Um, and a lot of times we do this by running our own trials or partnering with, with others to run trials. We did this in Potatoes in the Netherlands where, um, you know, it was a big collaboration to get into the potato market. Uh, we, we paid for a lot of trials out there and we showed that we can have better skin, um, you know, larger potatoes, more consistent. Um, so, you know, again, it's not like you said, conventional um, versus biological, but really showing that, you know, there's a benefit to both, that they work together really well. Um, and then putting our money where, where our mouth is, right? Running those trials and, and providing that evidence. Um, the visuals are so important. Um, so I think that's, you know, part of g gaining that trust, building that relationship. Okay. So let's keep moving on. So, uh, okay, this is interesting. It's one thing to get these, project, uh, uh, these projects federally registered and another to get them registered in the state of California or Washington or other states. The delays are really frustrating. How can we create an expedited pathway for temporary use of registrations of these safe, in quotes, tools? So again, from BPI's perspective, I we feel your pain. I mean, my, my members feel your pain. They want to get these project uh, products out to you all uh, just as much as you want to be using these products. And we, as BPIA, we work with both with EPA at, at the federal level and, and with the individual states like California and Washington. And, and we try to do everything we can to facilitate and, and expedite. But I don't know, the, uh, from our panelists, and any uh, thoughts on, on, this, on this question? Yeah, I think that's everybody's frustration. So I, I have nothing to add. <laughs> right, right. Okay, well, we'll keep moving on then. So there's a good one. The US Fertilizer uh, 
are primarily US, in the U.S. I'm sorry, fertilizer are, are, and claims are primarily regulated at the state level. Absolutely, there is no uh, like federal uh, fertilizer law. Are the state plant control officials supportive of the advancement of biologicals? And maybe I can kick this off. I, I would say yes. I mean, just in the same way the EPA is uh, supportive, the, the state regulators are. They see the benefits of biologicals. But just like EPA, I mean, the state regulators, they're constrained by their state um, federal uh, fertilizer laws and regulations. So uh, and we are BPI. We're working closely with AFCO, especially in the area of biostimulants, to try and promote and, and get a clear pathway and a regulatory framework for those products that just doesn't exist uh, yet. I think we will eventually have that. So, yeah, I think the, the, the state regulators are supportive, but they're completely constrained by the parameters of, of the system uh, that, that they're working in. Um, I'd love to hear thoughts. Mark, maybe you have some thoughts on this? Yeah, I would just sort of adding on to what you said. I think they're supportive. I think what they really want is clarity into what's a fertilizer, what's a biostimulant, and what's a, a biocontrol product. And I think that's what, what they really struggle with at times. And I know that you've worked quite a lot on, you know, Keith, with, with, with some of the partners at BPIA of trying to clarify the, the definitions and where biostimulants sit in this process. Uh, if, if we can get that worked out, I think the state officials are very supportive of, of the use of biologicals. Uh, they just uh, need that a little help in that area. I think I think they just they, I mean they see the benefits that all the benefits we've been talking about today. I mean think all, all the obvious benefits of biologicals. Karsten, Laura, any, anything you'd like to add on that one? Nothing to add. Okay, that, that's fine. We'll keep going. Oh, here's a good one. A real another. I love the real kind of real world practical. My planting and spraying equipment needs updating. What attachment should I be looking to utilize? Biologicals. I'm, I'm sure you can all speak to what, if anything, do do growers need to do uh, to prepare, say, to to moving to using biologicals, especially with regard to uh, spraying equipment, for example. Uh, I'll just whoever wants to jump in first. Go ahead. Short answer for, for Pivot is uh, our products are going to get designed um, so they work best when our microbes are in contact with the seed at planting, and and if you're looking at um, I uh, putting on some, some liquid, uh, onto your planter, uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, we always tell, uh, we always tell growers that, um, we're happy to, to kind of walk through, um, different types of equipment that your, you know, your local provider could, could help you, um, put onto that planter. Uh, key though, is we're going to try to, uh, build products that, that fit what, uh, most folks have available to them. Um, and, and it increased the, the complexity on our end. So it makes life easier for our customers. And, and so today it's, uh, it's a liquid that goes in furrow and I'd like that to be just something that comes as a, a seed treatment at some point too. Thanks, Laura. Any advice to growers as far as equipment for biologicals? Do your products require anything different? Yeah, I think it's the same answer as Karsten Bayer really does design um, their products with the grower in mind with the capabilities and on farm practices. So we're going to take into account, you know, do you want a, a solid product versus a liquid product? Do you what type of sprayer is typically used? How are you doing your tank mixes? Um, what types of compatibility do we need to have with other biologicals or even other chemistries? Um, so all of that is taken into account if you have a, a very specific you know, situation. You know, we're always here, you could reach out to me and I can always put you in touch with the correct people to provide you that customized um, advice for your, for your particular case. That's great. I know um, we are coming up against the time, so we'll try and get a few more questions. Uh, Carson, this is specifically for you. What do you see as the physical limitation to biological nutrient replacement of commercial fertilizers, primarily nitrogen? Corn requires more nitrogen per acre than soybeans, for example. Do you see your product slash platform being able to supply 100% of nitrogen required for crop like corn? Yes. And, and the science tells us that the plant, uh, the corn plant is able to uh, fix enough carbon during photosynthesis and exude uh, the portion of that as sugars so that there, there's more than enough energy there for microbes to fix in excess of 300 pounds of nitrogen per acre. 
So we've got a lot of opportunity ahead of us as a broad industry. Uh, there's an immense amount of energy coming from the plant uh, and available for the microbiome. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to help, uh, help get us all there soon. Thanks. Uh, the next one, uh, has there been documentation of risk reduction and what are the insurance and finance implications? I don't know, maybe Mark, are there finance implications that, that you're aware of related to risk reduction? I presume the, the idea of, you know, biologicals or reduce, reduce risk products. Is, is there anything that you could share about that? I'm not aware of any specific you know, finance or an insurance implication. Obviously, if you're replacing you know, a, an insecticide or, or, or another chemical product that has a, a, a long reentry period, with a biological that has a very short reentry period, yeah, that's a that's a critical uh, advantage to the grower in terms of managing the crop, especially for a fruit or vegetable that's picked multiple times. And there could be possibly some some insurance implications for that in terms of liability for the grower. But I'm just not aware of, of whether that that's uh, that's widely recognized by the insurance industry and whether that's reflected in, uh, in, in policies. I'm gonna presume Karsten and Laura, <laughs> you're good on that question, unless there is, did you wanna add anything on that? Go ahead, you know, Karsten. If, Go ahead. if anybody's interested in, in working in that space, um, please contact me. We've got a, a lot of good data uh, that we'd like to, to be talking about with you. Oh, okay, all right, great. Laura, anything else? Okay, so, okay, good, Laura, because I actually have a question for you specifically, I wanna get this to you. <laughs> This may be a nuance, but does Bayer look at biologicals as a separate category they want to promote or a potential solution in the toolbox to use? It seems there will be a group of growers that definitely want biologicals, but others that may not be as convinced yet, and having the biological label on something may inhibit adoption, where if you just sell the mode of action, science, et cetera, without a label, it may increase adoption. What, what's your, what are your thoughts on that, Laura? Yeah, that's a really good question. So you know, Bayer sees uh, biologicals as part of an, uh, an integrated solution, um, like I said, and it's, so it's an additional tool in the toolbox. Um, I think when you zoom in on the crop science technology divisions, you know, we have, um, or, you know, the segments, we have seeds and traits, we have uh, crop protection, and then we have seed growth. When you look at crop protection, that's comprised of both biologicals and, uh, and chemicals. Um, and so we really do see ourselves as um, very complementary as part of an integrated solution, a tailored solution um, with different benefits. Uh, we can come in and provide um, management to abiotic stress, increase yield, provide root soil health to help the crop establish, have more yield, um, just different things that maybe uh, some of our chemistries can't do. Offering that new mode of action to manage resistance, um, greater flexibility, shorter reentry intervals, et cetera. And so it really is just another tool in the toolbox for farmers to access. Great. And uh, we have just a couple more, which is good because we're all running out of time, but there are a couple of specific ones. So I, I don't know if folks will be able to answer these or not. Would the Haney soil test enhance the acceptance of biological, biologicals? And if so, that would require a complete rewrite of the current soil testing method, a very big task. Thoughts on this? Does anybody have thoughts on this? It's an inter interesting concept. And uh, I mean, certainly the, the, I, would, I would think for soil amendment type products, the Haney soil test would pick up, you know, advantages for some of the biostimulant soil amendment type products um, more quickly than other more typical uh, soil test approaches. So, yes, I think it could enhance the acceptance of some some soil amendment products in particular. Um, you know, how that would uh, how that is adapted, I. I and how we encourage that, that use, I really can't uh, uh, think of something off the top of my head of how to, how to approach that, but certainly there could be advantages, certainly if uh, you know, uh, researchers and, uh, and companies begin to identify uh, the, the Haney test as, a, as an effective way to measure uh, the beneficial effects of uh, biologicals, it, it could drive things in that direction. 
And with that, we are actually right up at a time. We only had um, one question left, so I'll just try and sneak in real quickly. Uh, the question is, would it be possible to use a critical use exemption designation for some of these products, recognizing that performance and background studies and statistics would be collected through large and wide scale use? Does anybody have any thoughts on that? And you, you got to keep it quick because we have to wrap up. <laughs> Okay, well, maybe that's one that we can find, uh, you know, follow up with the Farm Foundation folks and, and get back uh, so we can get a response to that. So with that, I just very, very, want to very quickly thank uh, Mark, Karsten, and Laura. Thank you so much. I learned a lot, so I'm, I'm sure our audience uh, learned a lot. And I want to thank the Farm Foundation for giving us this opportunity. And with that, I want to hand it back to Sherry. Thanks, Sherry. Great. Thanks so much, Keith. And great job to you and the panelists for tackling so many questions during our session. Really appreciate getting to all those audience questions. So as we reach the end of our time, I'd like to thank all of you, all of our speakers for their contributions today and to thank all of you in the audience for joining us and submitting so many great questions. We appreciate your engagement with us and would love to hear your feedback. So please take a moment to share your comments about today's session in the very brief survey you will see at the conclusion of this forum. Our next Farm Foundation Forum will take place August 11th, focusing on advancing digital agriculture at the farm level. We hope you'll mark your calendars and make plans to join us then. You can register now on our website, farmfoundation.org. The link to register is right on the homepage. If you'd like to help us continue providing valuable programming such as today's forum, I'll just quickly remind you that you can simply text the word field to the number 44321 at any time to receive donation instructions. Each and every gift strengthens our ability to address rapidly evolving issues impacting agriculture, the food system, and rural communities. And we are so appreciative of your support. So just to wrap it up, thank you once again for your engagement today, and we look forward to seeing you at future events. Thank you.